first question is, what is arabesque, right? That seems like the first thing to get out of the way. Well, arabesque is a term, uh, it's an art historical term used for this very distinctive design motif that is a sort of curvy, curvilinear form, a decorative form that winds around and is, it appears in many different forms actually, but it tends to have a sort of wandering path and be used uh, as a feature of ornament. Now, arabesque, its name, uh, as, as one might imagine, suggests origins in the Arab lands, but it should be said that arabesque is a motif that has been around, it has an ancient heritage. It is really, it appears in classical antiquity, in, uh, in Arab art and architecture, both both pre-Islamic and Islamic, and it surges in European art, uh, particularly after the 18th century, when, uh, and so the purpose in, uh, in this exhibition of my making the focus the 19th century, uh, mostly, with a couple of very, very few exceptions, um, is to focus on a moment when the arabesque, which at least in European art had been very, um, peripheral to most uh, of the art it decorated. In other words, it was an ornament that you might see on book bindings or at the edges of <clears throat> interior architecture or otherwise sort of at the edges comes to the fore and comes to the center of the composition and becomes a prominent, um, what we might say, even a principle of design itself. And so as we wind our way through the show, you will see this evolution. And this is the focus that that we've taken, um, which is also a way of showing how arabesque is not just a cross-cultural motif, but it is also a cross-artistic motif. In other words, it brings together different art forms, all of which have forms of arabesque in them. Um, so in the visual arts, we see, see arabesque as the motif I just described, but in music, there are also musical arabesques. Um, in arabesque, in dance, there is arabesque. And so some of these different art forms will manifest themselves in the different kinds of works you'll see here on display. But in this first section, uh, we're setting up the, uh, uh, the sort of transition from uh, arabesque as a border motif to one that comes to the center of the, of the composition. And you can see this pretty dramatically um, in this first uh, wall, or a set of works on the wall. I set this up with an 18th century a print after a design by the French artist uh, Jean-Antoine Bateau. Um, and this is the kind of Rococo design that would have been used as a pattern for different kinds of interior decoration, even for um, things like upholstery or book designs or textiles, porcelain. These were very um, mobile kinds of um, images that could take form in different uh, kinds of materials. But the print itself, as you'll see, is centered around a scene and then bordered by all sorts of organic vegetal ornaments, some floral, some intertwining branches and leaves. And it's understood that what's happening at the center is the main event and the uh, decorations around the edges are, are of some different character <clears throat> um, that, that don't really bear on the content or the narrative. When we move um, down the wall, then to uh, completely then contrast to this set of four times of the day prints by um, Philip Otto Rugge. This is a stark transition where um, we've, we're now in the sort of center, center um, of German romanticism. Uh, Runge is an artist who's very interested in, in uh, the symbolic and spiritual meanings of the forms that he's making. And so I, I put these together to sort of both as comparison and contrast, you can see some superficial surface resemblances, the bilateral symmetry that was just mentioned, um, the love of different floral motifs and decorations that <clears throat> seem to really enliven the spaces of the, of the print, and yet the structure here is quite different. Um, everything is integrated, and so that the arabesques that you see around the borders are of a very similar character and stature as the ones in the, in the middle. And so you can see that from a, a, a rococo image like the acrobat by Bateau over to Runga's Times of the Day, so it's a reflection on the times of the day, but also the seasons of life and much more um, uh, symbolic subject matter, there's a, a 
clear transition, and this kind of imagery is one that the German romantics will use a lot in book illustration. So I won't pause on all the works here, but <clears throat> just to keep in mind that all around this section, this first section of the exhibition, you'll be seeing most uh, uh, works on paper that have some connection with literature and are intended to illustrate and use this profusion of ornament um, in strongly uh, symbolic ways and ways that really take, um, as I said, pretty much occupy the entire composition. I really do encourage you to look at <clears throat> this work. It's a, it's a uh, large scale print and uh, illustration to the well-known story of Sleeping Beauty by the Brothers Grimm. Uh, the artist here is called Eugène Napoleon, <laughs> even though he was not French, uh, Neureuter, uh, a German. And here you can, it's a really spectacular, um, oh, it's a tour de force, first of all, of, of etching. But you'll see that the text of the Sleeping Beauty tale is actually in tiny script here in this little stone wall. So it, um, the, the illustration around is all illustrating this, this uh, tale, which could only be read with a microscope, presumably, <laughs> or a magnifying glass. So this is the kind of imagery that sets up a new stature, I'm arguing, for arabesque in the early 19th century. In this large square gallery at the back, we've, we've gathered many examples by, again, a range of European artists who, at the end of the 19th century, are, you, are incorporating arabesque in very innovative ways, um, in ways that in, in effect begin to govern the entire composition of what they're doing. Uh, so it's not that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an addition, it's not that it's a sort of decorative um, appendage, but truly the center, it's the driving force behind these works of art. Uh, you can see that they are in, in various media. We have still book illustration, um, book by William Morris, really incorporating uh, all over arabesque design um, to adorn um, a, a book for the Kelmscott Press. And then, uh, you know, so there's, there's just an array of artists, many of whom will be very familiar to you. Uh, Toulouse Lautrec in the corner. Uh, we have Maurice Denis. We also have uh, Alphonse Mucha, the posters at the back. I will say, though, that um, about this grouping uh, to the left of me, this is um, a, a selection that really points out the importance of dance in arabesque. Um, there's a particular dancer at the end of the 19th century, Loie Fuller, who uh, is, becomes known for what she called her serpentine dance that she performed in very dramatic billowing costumes and used in special lighting. We will, and during the run of the show, have a performance in, uh, on the 1st of March that um, is a tribute to this kind of performance. So there's a modern day performer and choreographer who, who, has, who has delved into this. And so these are photographs of Louis Fuller performing and also a Toulouse-Lautrec print from the Clark's collection at the right that is also an attempt to represent her. But you see what an abstract design actually forms um, when the artist is reducing the figure to, mostly to the form of her dress and you can see barely a head and feet here. Uh, so this is a, a really a, considered one of the most revolutionary prints Toulouse Lautrec made in his whole lifetime to get to this point of a sort of frozen image of motion. And uh, you can see that sense of line motion movement continuing really throughout the room. Um, there is the time where we saw the front, not quite so big in, in, <laughs> in the real. Um, but also in the spectacular painting by Maurice Denis, who's a leader of the Vanguard Navi group of painters, um, every line in here seems to be a curving, undulating arabesque line. And it, even in the, the uh, so it's a painting, actually uh, originally a poster designed to advertise a newspaper uh, the, in the French city of Toulouse, La Dépêche de Toulouse, and so this female figure who's standing holding the paper is herself in arabesque and the paper slipping out of her hand also sort of waft and move in ways that are reflective of, of the arabesque line as well. So it's a sort of constellation of arabesques leading to an overall design that's quite distinctive to this period. Um, and perhaps um, for the moment we can, we can end on the, the set of uh, Alphonse Mugler posters. Um, he is one of the leading figures of Art Nouveau, 
who's um, women with their swirling hair uh, is almost a trademark of his work. And we have a set of three here, all from different institutions, that uh, in different ways reflect the importance of arabesque to him. I point out especially um, this one called Joe, which is an advertisement for cigarette rolling papers, if you can believe it. And so this cigarette smoke whir whirls around in an arabesque form, much like the women's hair, and they, they join together um, in ways that are, again, I, I argue, revolutionary for, for design. Um, and that theme continues around the edge. Maybe we'll just um, finish up with the book in the case. The music theory uh, primer, or the Petit Solfège Illustré, and this is a book that was a co-production of, uh, of two brother-in-laws, brothers-in-law. Um, the artist is Pierre Bonnard, so in, in the Navi group, along with Denis, as we saw, and he is expressing elements of musical um, theory, uh, things like note values, and this would have been a book for children to use as they're learning music but his very inventive drawings are, are um, dissolving uh, forms into arabesque lines in ways that are both playful and, and very ingenious. So um, I, I'm really happy to, I, I could go on a long time about <laughs> these works as you've gathered, uh, but I'm happy to um, talk in either uh, in, in this group or individually about any questions you might have about the exhibition or works in it. So thank you. Yeah. I have a, a couple of general questions. First, uh, if you could maybe put this in the context of illuminated manuscripts, which came much earlier, mm -hmm. how they differ from that. Uh, I mean, they're, the, the crusades were going on. There might have been some exposure to them. There, there was a lot of interchange, I think, and we're, we're always realizing more and more, and earlier and earlier than, than we uh, ever realized. Um, so I, there are some uh, correlations. I did look some uh, illuminated manuscripts as I was thinking about this show in early stages. I realized that I had to hone in the, certainly the time frame to make it a coherent show. But um, there are, there are uh, connections, and particularly I think in the work of uh, Durer, who uh, when he, that's sort of the German source for a lot of the illustrations that we saw in the first room. Um, I mean, he did, illustrations for a prayer book of Emperor Maximilian that are, that are calling on much earlier forms mm -hmm. of, of illumination mm -hmm. uh, and, and manuscript decoration. So, so it's a, it might be a distant ancestor, but certainly among the sources. Okay. And coming to the other end of the, mm -hmm. uh, of, of the time period, um, the earlier ones look more, more balanced. And, I mean, they're mirror images of whatever and so on. And, and as, as we progress through time, the surfaces become very active and frenetic with all sorts of movements and so on. Yes. Uh, this period, I guess, maybe arts and crafts and, and uh, uh, the beginning of the uh, art nouveau and all yes. that. So there was something going on in art that re-employed the arabesque in a different way. Yes. Can you say anything? About that? Yeah. Well, I mean, and that—that's exactly what the the exhibition is is arguing. So I'm glad that comes through in the hang and, and in the um, um, in the flow of the exhibition. So I do think there is something that changes. I think that there is a, a change from very symmetrical and ordered designs to something that's much freer. And I think what arabesque does over this period is to become a sort of emblem of um, not just formal freedom, motion, movement, liveliness, but also a kind of imaginative freedom. freedom. And that's influenced by uh, the, uh, these other arts, music and dance. And, and these artists are, um, visual artists that we're looking at are, are actively engaged with developments in the other arts and are trying to cross over between them. And, and I think that accounts for a lot of the innovation that you see. And, and the media they're working in too. I mean, these much more lithograph type things, whereas the others would have been engravings. Or yes, yes, and you have color, and, and color is a color. huge, um, I mean, it's a, a sort of sub-theme sub of this show. You see it in the Owen Jones, I didn't mention it, but those uh, color lithographed illustrations were really in the infancy of that technology, mm -hmm. and his books were some of the first to really make use of this fantastic color technology in printing, and then that continues into Art Nouveau, mm -hmm. so that um, in a way gives many, more possibilities for arabesque. Yeah, thanks. 